pleasure to introduce Gavin Reed here. What we're doing in this next 40 minutes is doing a session that we're calling Startup Pitches. One of the things that we want to do in this conference is really bring an entrepreneurial mindset. So what we're going to have for you today is three different um, companies, real world companies, who are going to pitch their startups. Um, so first we're going to have Gavin Reed, and I'll let him take away with his pitch, but we'll have um, um, a quick pitch and then time for questions, and probably when Eric gets here, he can introduce himself. But Gavin, please take it away. Is this, oh, we've got it working. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me here this morning. Uh, I am a songwriter and multi-instrumentalist, but that's not what I'm here for today. Uh, basically, we were frustrated with how little social media promotes social interaction in the real world. It's essentially quite anti-social by nature. It's a popularity contest, generates anxiety, and keeps people glued to their phones. So Buddy App, we created Buddy App to put the social back in social media. It's a direct response to this isolation and anxiety caused by social media, and we want to harness technology as a way of encouraging social engagement in the real world. So if I could show you a brief video. It should be some funky music, but... Don't worry, I'll just talk over it instead. So basically, if you see the concept here, you can join people's plans and go and meet them, or you can create your own plans and put them out there for other people to join you. So some of the major, what I would term, anti-social networks, you'll know these, the big four, they all count their users in the billions, but I would argue that many people have certain issues with these platforms. So, there is a need for pro-social media. By what, there's basically one in four people in the world, young people especially, uh, but this is 16 plus, are lonely. Uh, social media is linked to these increased, infe increased feelings of isolation, and they are increasing with every generation and with every year. Also, we live in Valencia here. Uh, Valencia has 14% uh, of the population are expatriates, foreigners. Uh, there are also these increased trends towards uh, digital nomads, remote working. People are reaching out all the time to meet new people and to do things that they enjoy and make meaningful connections. The anti-social media networks don't really address this issue. You may have heard of something similar to what we're doing, Meetup. We have certain issues with Meetup. To create an event, you need to pay. You then have to have a special interest, whether it's watercolors or poetry, whatever it is. But then once you've started your group, you're attached to that interest, and you have certain extra obligations as a group admin. Also for users, as the creators are uh, paying to create, they want money from people who join their events. Buddy App, on the other hand, basically we've tried to address each of these issues that I have with Meetup. All our plans are free to create. I intend on them being free forever. You don't need a special interest. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want, walk the dog, go for a coffee, get people to join you. These are one-off events. They don't have to be recurring events that you're obliged to do. We already have busy lives. And the people that you meet are not trying to make money from you. They're just genuinely trying to make connections. 
our goal is to get as many users as possible. We're doing this through offering free premium accounts for all users in Valencia. We're catering our plans to our, our target demographic, and we're making sure that we have no paid plans and no ads. What this means for us is zero monetization for now and for as long as possible. Our results so far is we've been in the App Store, uh, both App Stores, for just over a month. Uh, we have over 900 downloads. We've reached over 200,000 accounts in Valencia uh, via social media and advertising. And we've, all we've done all of this on my high school teacher salary. So basically, no funds at all. So a great success so far, but still very, very early days. We're not counting in the billions yet, but you know, maybe in a couple of weeks. So thank you very much. Hello, hello. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, guys, hi, my name is Eric Barros. I'm moderating the panel. I was a few minutes late, my apologies. Um, uh, just to, before we get into your pitch, uh, just as a quick introduction to the purpose of what we're doing here today. Um, this session is an attempt to recreate what a pitch would look like from an entrepreneur to a VC, to a venture capitalist investor. And that's me today. I'm playing the, the mock role of a VC. Um, I think we're going to get my bio up here on the screen in a minute, but in, as, as a quick introduction, um, I've been on both sides of the VC table in, in technology and music and entertainment for 30 years or so. Um, that's my bio there. Uh, I've raised as an entrepreneur uh, tens of millions of dollars for music tech companies and, and music festivals and record labels. I'm also an angel investor, so I've been an, an advisor to VCs. So my job today is to kind of act as uh, the mock VC that's going to poke holes and ask pointed questions to the entrepreneurs that we're going to see on stage today. Um, and again, that's not to shred the, the projects uh, that we're going to see on stage today. It's to sort of show and demonstrate to the audience what the interaction is between an entrepreneur and an investor behind closed doors. What are the things that are discussed? What are the questions that are asked? What are the challenges that are posed? And maybe our entrepreneurs today can also take some of those challenges and, uh, and sharpen their pitch. You know, maybe there are some unanticipated things that, uh, that, we, that may come up today. So with that, um, on uh, Buddy App, uh, Gavin, so a couple questions um, for you if I were a VC and had heard your, your short pitch. Um, so it's notoriously hard to build uh, online or offline communities and even more hard to retain them over time and keep people coming back. Um, what's your, What's your go-to-market strategy? Um, you've gone to market, but what's, let's say, the next 12 months of Buddy App um, in terms of growing community and retaining them? What does that look like? And after that, what does your growth uh, plan look like? Well, already a great deal of our users have come from events that we have planned ourselves. So we, we had a cultural fair where we had dancing, free dancing classes, art lessons, uh, clothes exchange, book exchange, things like that. So basically our method is to try and create events. It's obviously this, the idea is not for us to be creating events in the long term, but for now to get people involved. We're trying to create events and put things out there and promote these things that people want. The, the fair that we did was hugely successful. We've never done anything like that before but we give people what they want. They don't know that they want Buddy App, but they want to go to a fair on a Saturday afternoon. They want to, they want to take part in these workshops, uh, and they want to have a drink and have something to eat and just spend a nice afternoon and evening. And, and those things take production costs too. So, they you're, do. so you're raising money at this time or no? No. Okay. So this is um, this is this bootstraps. is coming out of our pocket. Uh -huh. and, but you know, we did this uh, the fair, for example. We do other things like pub quizzes, beach days, picnics, things like that, that cost much less. The fair came out of our pocket, but 
everyone who was involved, we had many, many stalls, everybody who was involved was really shocked by the, the success of it. And if next time around we can just ask them for a minimal amount of money to cover the expense of the fair, then we're not losing. Is your long-term goal to create profit though? I mean, I would assume. My long-term goal is to get as many users as possible. As far as I can say, when we talk about monetization, there is money in people. If you have a million users, you're more likely to attract investment. If you have 10 million users, you'll get more investment. So my main aim is to get investment from venture capitalists to try and improve, develop the app, but also to spread it. I mean, it, we're focused in Valencia because that's what our funds allow. And you want to scale, so but we can, It can be used in any city in the world. So the idea would be if we get enough investment, yeah, we can go to Madrid, Barcelona, London, Paris. Okay, and you haven't thought about uh, amounts of money that you need, when you would need them. Is it after I'll, I'll having hit a certain? I'll take anything at the moment. <laughs> right. <laughs> Donations. I'll be passing around a hat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you haven't developed um, like a, requ a capital requirement idea or or a use of funds. At the moment, our idea is to spend the money that we have set aside to get as many users as possible to build a community. Once our money runs out, if no one has kind of come to us by that point, then we're like, well, our money's run out, so we're just going to go and see, go to these investors and see what we can get, if anything. Okay, so I, I, uh, just as a concluding note there, and, and this is slipping out of the VC role for a minute and, and kind of coming back to real, the real world, um, you. you will need a very strong ROI story when that day happens, that you go to an investor. Um, a VC is not going to want to hear no monetization. Right? We do have ideas for monetization. We do have clear ideas about how things can be monetized. But I do not want to monetize things from our users. This is more from maybe um, not advertisements, but we have template plans, so if you're not sure what you want to do, this is where we cater to our target demographic. For example, we have local coffee shops, uh, ceramics workshops, things like that, where we offer they offer a discount as a suggested plan. So someone can tap on this and say, I want to do this. Uh, I want four people to do it with me, whether they're people I know already or just people in the local area then they can go to this place and they get a 10% discount. This is all free for these businesses at the moment, but it's a way that in the future, if we have enough users, people will pay to have their business as a template. So it's not an advertisement, because it's still actually people who are driving this, okay. but it's a way for these businesses to become more visible and gain more clients. Okay. Um, I'm just going to mind the clock here also, guys, uh, because we have until only the bottom of the hour. Um, so we have time for one question uh, from the audience, either to the entrepreneur or to the mock VC that is me. Please. Um, hi. Hi. My name is Lita, so we can have a bigger conversation. I was curious, uh, you talked about a lot of people you've worked with have been stuck on it. talked about a lot of people using social media and being stuck on it. There's already I lived in Amsterdam for seven years. I kind of already interacted in some of these groups on social media. We made plans and we did activities. So I would say that as someone that uses social media, I would go immediately to the source where I get disconnection at the same time connection. Um, and as someone that lived outside, I've seen a lot of my colleagues leave. How do you plan on keeping that audience that you say that's 14% of people living in Valencia when there's a high chance that they will be leaving because maybe their studies finish, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they get another job somewhere else. And also there's already groups, for example, the Erasmus Plus that already builds a community, has been built in a community for a lot of years. How do you plan on retaining or attracting that, 
that audience? Well, attracting them is just that we have a much simpler UX design than many. I know like Facebook, yeah, you can meet up with people through Facebook. It is possible, but it's kind of clunky and inefficient. Much of the time we see people posting, but a lot of people are actually just trying to sell stuff on Facebook as well. They're, I'm a yoga instructor, come to my classes, it's 10 euro an hour, you know. So you can do it through Facebook and other social media outlets, but it is a little bit clunkier, a little more awkward. And also in terms of retaining people who are leaving, if they're leaving, perhaps they can bring the app, spread the word to different places. But also we don't intend on just targeting expats. We're targeting expats now because that's what our funds allow us to do. And they are the kind of people I think will be our initial audience, adopt the app, use the app because they do want to meet people. G Gavin, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt uh, and call time. Um, thank you for presenting um, uh, your app today. And, thank you uh, for having me. Yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you for your questions. And, and again, uh, this, this would also be true to life in a real venture capital scenario when the VC says, stop, we have another appointment walking in the door right now, and they cut you off just like that. So this is real life. So they, thank you. they drag me out screaming. And they drag you out with a vaudeville <laughs> cane right off the stage. So thank you, Gavin. And uh, a little applause for Gavin, please. And thank you very much. We're going to call PID to the, to, the, to the stage, please. And this one's going to be timed. So we have four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, hello, everybody. First of all, I would like to say a big thank you to Berkeley team for inviting me today to be, to be here. I am Piedi, I'm CEO and co-founder of Funder. And I'm going to present my project here today the same way I do when I go to pitch at an investor event. So four minute pitch. Uh, let's go. Um, Funder was born two years ago being a marketplace connected musicians, cover musicians with contractors for events such as weddings, birthday, corporates. The idea was to make it easier to find and hire a musician and also offer new opportunities to, for, to play for these musicians. But after two years working hand in hand with them, we detected that there are a lot of more problems. The problem goes much farther. The first of all, they are no they are very unprofessionalized. They don't know how to manage their finance. And also, most, most of them are not the, the dice. The second one is that they lose a lot of opportunities because they are not able to invoice some of their events, and also because they don't know how to make themselves known. And the third one, they spend a lot of time and stress managing their leads. They have to elaborate budgets, negotiate, answering WhatsApps. So how do we solve these problems from Funder? Well, we have a web platform that, on the one hand, we offer them new opportunities to be higher. And on the other hand, since mm, this year, two months ago, more or less, we offer them additional services like billing their events or visibility in the media or managing their leads and finance. So if we talk about business model, we are changing from a marketplace to a SaaS-enabled marketplace. And how do we monetize? How do we earn money? Well, in the part of the marketplace, we, we have a commission chart from the musician's cache. And in the services, we have a freemium model with separate paid services. But the idea is to package them in the future. Um, to give you an idea, with a little invest in product, what we have achieved is more than 2,500 musicians registered in the platform, more than 450 events or hired, and more than 36,000 euros of revenue. We have come this far with 70 euros, 70,000 euros uh, partner contribution plus 69,000 from Anisa. It's like debt. And we are now looking for one 1,500 euros for product and app development, mainly. And finally, who are fighting day by day for this dream? My partner, Nacho, and me. He's an industrial engineer. He has a master in big data and Azure. 
and his, the, his role is CTO, and he's a musician. And me, I studied law and business, a master in music industry, and I have work experience in before a record label and, all other, and, in, and in another startups. And I am a freaky of concerts and festivals. So um, we, are, we together com complement each other perfectly. And with the support of startup accelerators like, like Lanzadera and Bicominator, we are sure that we can effectively digitize this industry. I think uh, music is cool, but live music is cooler. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, you still had 36 seconds to go, so good, <laughs> good uh, economics on your time there. Um, so putting on an investor hat or a venture capital hat, um, can you talk a little bit more about the use of funds? So you're raising 150K. You mentioned product and app development would be the main use, but yeah. I mean, I would imagine salaries too, or is this a side hustle at this point? And, and are you paying yourselves from that money as well, you and your partner? We, we have been without salary for the first one year and a half, and we've been receiving a salary the last six months because it's necessary. The, the, it comes one time that you have to receive something because if not, like your brain and your power goes down and you, you need to see some, some money else. <laughs> we need to live. <laughs> yeah, and, and stepping outside of VC hat for a minute, this is something that comes up a lot. It's, it's uh, you know, is the entrepreneur gonna pay themselves from the money that they're raising? And that answer is actually quite a good answer because a lot of people, entrepreneurs I've seen, think, oh, maybe I just don't pay myself anything and that's gonna impress a venture capitalist. It doesn't. Because the venture capitalist wants to know that their racehorse is well-fed and well-rested and is providing for themselves and not struggling financially um, you know, and, and, and not making ends meet personally. That makes it into a bad investment. So it is absolutely fair uh, to pay yourself maybe just below what a market salary yeah. would be. You take a little cut maybe off whatever your market rate would be and take 10% off of that. Mm -hmm. That's your salary and that's very justifiable to uh, a venture capitalist nine out of 10 times. It, it's it's a, a myth that the investor wants to see you not make money uh, and, and not take a salary from, from those funds. So that was a very good answer on that. Um, and what about uh, marketing? in terms of budget, and this is a two-phase question, because at the end of the day, you're creating a marketplace, a two-sided marketplace, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. and one, on one side, you have your supply side, which are artists, and congratulations for uh, obtaining 2,500 of them mm -hmm. already. Um, on the other side, you have talent buyers. So it's the wedding planner, I guess, yeah. or it's the uh, event organizer that wants to hire mm -hmm. a band, hire a musician, and so mm -hmm. forth. So you have a supply side, demand side. That means that your, your marketing is also oh. twofold. You have to attract artists to the platform to create mm -hmm. inventory, and you have to attract the wedding planners and the event organizers to book that talent. Mm -hmm. How do you think about marketing strategy on both supply and demand side, and would the use of funds from the 150K mm -hmm. uh, support that marketing strategy? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, the use of funds, it's, it's going to be like 40% for the product and app development, and it's going to be 30% for marketing and the other 30% for key, key equip, key team, okay, contracting key team. Um, um, yeah, that's sure. Marketplace has some bad things and it's like you have offer uh, supply and, and demand and you have to spend double marketing to capture both, both sides. But uh, we capture musicians. Um, the, the cost of acquisition of a musician is two euro. A fully, fully musician with his profile on Funder completely useful. So it's very, very cheap. Oh, that, that's what I think. <laughs> and for the, the, uh, the demand, that's the um, difficult part because we spend a lot of t a lot of money at, at the beginning because we were in in our minds we wanted like B2C um, model. We were looking for people who for birthdays, weddings, and then we realized that it was easier to get to the wedding planners or spaces or where you celebrate your wedding. It's like um, more difficult uh, to get to them, 
but it's cheaper at the end because they repeat, they repeat. They bring you the clients and they repeat. So that's what I'm, we're, we are doing now. Okay, so that's, that's great that you've identified what, what uh, is called customer acquisition cost or CAC, mm -hmm. CAC is the acronym, two, uh, two euros to acquire a new artist under the platform. Um, it would be interesting to, to hear a defensible case on what the CAC is for acquiring a, a, a paying customer on mm -hmm. the demand side, like a wedding planner, for example, uh -huh. a buyer. That would be interesting. And it would also be good, you just broke down your use of funds of the 150K because an investor is gonna wanna know where their money's, how their money's being spent, um, which is why I asked the question. So I could see a pie chart uh, in your presentation yeah. that, that says exactly what you said. It's 40% yeah. for dev and 20% mm -hmm. uh, for salary and, and, and the rest is marketing. Um, the, uh, the last question I had before we turn one over to the audience is that uh, in a marketplace strategy like yours, um, there's an inherent risk of, of both supply and demand side cutting you out as the platform. <laughs> it's the Airbnb conundrum where you, you meet your Airbnb host and uh -huh. next time you go there, you just WhatsApp yeah. them and pay them cash and Airbnb makes no money. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you keep yourself uh, from being cut out as a marketplace mm -hmm. from that wedding planner, for example, who's just gonna go straight to the band next month and hire them directly with, mm -hmm. and not pay you your fees? Well, um, at the beginning we didn't want to see that, but, <laughs> but yeah, that, that happens and happens a lot. And we realized that and that's why we are turning into a sustainable marketplace marketplace we want to offer more and more and more value to the musicians so they want to stay with us the the proposal is uh, not only they want to contract outside of funder so the, the the leads they have outside of funder bring them to us because we can help them negotiating elaborating budgets and that the commission in that kind of of of, of cases it's going to be lower but that but that value add of helping an artist negotiate a deal and get more money and so forth does that scale like it can you can you negotiate 300 contracts for 300 artists next week with you just between you and your partner like how do you scale that service side of, of servicing artists let's call it well we don't we don't we're not going to obligate them or sign contracts that they can only do it with us yeah. i think that this, this is not the way to try to um, send this service. It's, mo it's more a thing about a confi confidence with them. They need to see us like we are experts uh, selling and negotiating with clients. They can have a 90% uh, of close uh, events with us. To totally get that, but the, the question was more, if you're negotiating on behalf of the artist, let's call that your artist services component of your, of your model, how do you scale that? Because if you're negotiating oh. with a client, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this band's gonna cost a thousand. No, yeah. it's two thousand. Like that's emails, that's WhatsApps, that's phone mm. calls, that's a manual process yeah. that's not AI driven, that's not technology driven, it's human driven. So how do you, you know, it, it, does that mean that the more deals you have in your pipeline, the bigger your team needs to become to handle that manual care and feeding of, yeah. of each? It's, it's a mix, yeah. I, the more leads I have in my pipeline, more people, but, um, we also uh, have to automatize a lot of process in, in all that. Since we started, um, I, I was uh, managing all that leads. I could do like um, 50 a month, and I spend my whole time. Now, I'm doing like 150, because of automations we have already implemented, and that's why we need to keep doing, so that, yeah, we will need more people, but one people would, be able to cover more leads. And I'm sure there's some kind of CRM. I mean, you're using HubSpot yeah. or Asana or something mm -hmm. like that on the back end. Okay, um, looking at time, do we have one question from the audience for the VC or the entrepreneur? Thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just would like a clarification on your value proposition. Mm -hmm. Are you a marketplace for musicians or are you a marketplace for good musicians? In other terms, uh, do you have any kind of filters or selection process when you talk to musicians? Mm -hmm. And do you have any uh, mechanism for quality control? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> good question. Uh, we are marketplace for cover musicians. That's the first point, because uh, the, the, the events we do, they need cover musicians, okay? And yeah, we have a process to, to 
um, certificate them as good, um, normal, or um, very, very amateur musicians, <laughs> okay? <laughs> we don't say them, no, you can stay here, but uh, they are not visible, for example, uh, to contract them. Um, um, also, with the new services we're launching now, um, some of the services, for example, uh, in Spain, I don't know how others in Spain, but in Spain, you cannot build or invoice an event if you are not freelance. Um, musicians that are not professional, they are not freelance because they have to pay a lot and they are not freelance. So they, this is one of um, segment that we can help them with that feature of building events. But then the other feature or service about managing leads or finance, these are uh, for um, professional musicians. So we segment our musicians inside of the, of the platform because that's the way we have to know which services goes well for each, each of them. So they have to be autonomous oh. to work for you. Um, <laughs> That's a, yeah, that's a legal, um, but uh, the, the reality is, uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a very black world in, in Spain, uh, music industry, at least non-professional musicians. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, I've just been informed that our third entrepreneur that was gonna zoom in is actually not gonna happen, so that buys us a few more minutes with PAD. Um, so I'll touch on what you just said about the industry being black. Um, if I'm a musician and you're handling my billing, uh, before you, I may have been charging cash because cash is great <laughs> and cash is amazing and cash is off the books. So is, is your system a threat? Um, how do I phrase this in a politically correct way? Uh, like, do I basically have to pay taxes <laughs> on, your, on the revenue that I make through your platform yeah. or, or is it the same as it was before and it's, it's on the honor system for me to report it? You should. <laughs> Um, the <laughs> what happens is like we we mm, mm, well the, the client uh, pays our commission in advance in concept of reservation book of the of the concert and then the part f for the musician he pay him in cash okay uh, that that's the thing that's the normal but so you're not handling so the payment flow that you see is only your commission and you're not receiving yeah. uh, the payment for the performance itself. it depends that's if if the musician is freelance and i can pay her through a, an invoice i get the whole money and then pay him but that's not the usual that's not the usual that's what we are fighting for because there is more and more and more clients um like a business or wedding planners that they need the invoice. So we need the musician can, can do it. That's why we're now um, offering them the services of billing for, for them. And we did this through a collaboration with another um, company that do this. Guys, any questions for PAD and the Fander platform? Or me on the grilling? Hello. Hi. Um, just a question on uh, if you could talk about, I think you were incubated at Lanzadera. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about what resources are available for startups uh, in Valencia specifically or, or just in general, this kind of incubator programs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it, Lanzadera offered us a lot of things like, um, tarla, um, like conference speakers from people who for all, on other entrepreneurs and also advisors and a lot of mentors and help through like for 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 example loyalty things or um, well a, lo a lot of things but i will say that the the most uh, value it's the networking because you are there um, with a lot of entrepreneurs uh, with a lot of business model difference in different industries, different stages in the business, in their business, and you can share a lot of uh, information, very uh, value, values. Anything else, guys? Okay, well, yeah, in conclusion, I mean, I think uh, it was a solid pitch. You had good answers to what a VC would ask you. Um, and 
you didn't have to be asked about monetization, which I think is very important. If you mm -hmm. have four minutes, like that's got to be front and center because the person that's got the checkbook on the other side of the table um, wants to know what their return on investment is going to be and when. That's mm -hmm. absolutely top of mind. Your dream is great, but if I put in 150k, when does that turn into five million? So that's that's um, that's good that you addressed that right up front and on the nose and, and didn't have to be asked for it because that's a very common mistake that I see too. It's like, you know, if if you're, if you have to be asked how you make money, mm -hmm. yeah. you missed like the, one of the most critical things in, in that four-minute pitch that you could have delivered, and, and you did that, so that was very good. Um, well, I wish you the very best of luck. It's a very cool project, and uh, yeah, guys, let's give a round of applause for PAD and Thank Vander. You. Thank you. And we are at the 12.30 mark, which means there's a 15-minute break, I believe. It's a 15-minute break. Uh, so, guys, thank you for your attention. Sorry. For